Hello, if you'd rather be confident and proactive with clear ideas about what you can do to handle stress than just reactive and running from stress, stay tuned because I'm going to talk with you about how to think about building your stress management toolkit. Welcome to Wellness with John. I'm John Peters, and these are resources to help you thrive. I help people go from being stressed to permanently improving their ability to cope with anxiety and stress and life's challenges. I'm a mindfulness-based therapist who's been in practice for over 26 years now, and I've helped thousands of people lower their stress and improve their range of tools to cope with challenges in life. So in this video, I want to talk a little bit about just how to approach the project of building your stress management toolkit. And this is something that I've thought about quite a lot because not only have I been a therapist for 26 years dealing with a myriad uh, array of problems that people bring to therapy, that in one way or another are really about dealing with stress. But I also, for uh, 15 years, taught a full semester undergraduate stress management course at Indiana University, where I had during that time thousands of students in those classes who also wanted to learn about how to build their stress management toolkit. So I've had lots of practice in talking with people about just how to even approach the project, which is what I want to share with you in this video. So what I've found is that the general path that people have, if you get on the path at all, toward building specific tools that you put in your stress management toolbox, the path usually starts with some sort of distress because Often people just don't think about stress, people don't think about wellness until something impinges on their functioning or makes them too miserable. And then they get to a point where they get motivated to think, man, I need to do something to change this situation. Perhaps there's something that I can actually change in myself or the way that I'm perceiving and reacting to things, or there's some skill that I don't have for a particular type of challenge. So, you know, generally people are ignoring their stress mostly, even though obviously you and I and everyone, if, if someone asks you, do you have some stress? All of us can easily intuitively answer that in the affirmative and say, yeah, I've got some stress. But <clears throat> for the most part, people ignore stress until it becomes too distressful. So the first part of the journey is often that we're just, you know, staying, you know, willfully oblivious to it as much as we can because we're, we're focusing on other aspects of life. But then something pops up and at some point we have frank distress and it starts to turn our attention toward that situation and even then what we can do about it to try to improve it. You could think about this as akin to ignoring your car maintenance until the check engine light comes on, okay? Um, that's kind of the attitude that most people have for their wellness and for their stress management is let's just ignore it and hope the tires don't fall off or the car doesn't run out of oil or gas or something and we'll just wait until a light comes on and tells us that we have to do something, right? But obviously that's not really the best strategy for managing stress, as I'll get to here in this video, because for one thing, it ignores things that need to be in place in order to stop stress from getting distressful in the first place. Again, using the analogy of the car, if you don't change the oil ever, eventually that's going to cause a problem, right? So there's this fundamental foundational thing that needs to be in place, not only for optimal functioning, but for sustained functioning of the car, you have to change the oil, you have to put gas in it, you have to check the tires, you have to change the wiper blades, whatever it happens to be. If you want the car to perform the way you want it to perform, maintenance has to happen 
foundational things need to be in place to keep that happening and to maximize your opportunities, like being able to get in your car and drive somewhere. So, but with our bodies and our, our system, we often are taking the approach of let's just ignore it and not really do anything and just hope everything works out and then just wait until the check engine light comes on before we actually do something. So for a lot of people, the path to come into therapy to ask someone like me for advice about how to improve that and also for my students that I had at the university, the motivation was that they had become aware that the check engine light was on in one way or another, that they were concerned about something or they were distressed by something. So, so distress I define as the type of stress that starts to diminish our functioning or causes us to be subjectively miserable to some degree, right? So that's what we call distress, okay? As opposed to just stress, because there could be stress that doesn't really distress us too much, right? And we don't necessarily do anything about it. But distress is when stress starts to get to a higher level or show up in a way that actually starts to make us miserable or starts to diminish our functioning in one way or another. So the journey that most people follow is ignore it, ignore it, ignore it, and then at some point become aware of some type of distress that's happening, and then usually people you know naturally are going to do things to adjust to whatever that stressor is but part of the problem is that the person may lack a, a sufficient ability to respond to the particular challenge that they're facing and therefore the stressor doesn't go away or maybe it actually worsens and also based on what i was saying about the foundational stuff if someone hasn't been taking care of themselves in a more holistic way, then when the particular challenge appears and starts causing the stress, then it may not take a whole lot of extra stress to tip the person over into having the check engine light come on, right? So the person may be flying along at an elevated stress level because they're not taking care of themselves. And <clears throat> then when this challenge appears, it loads them up with extra stress. They go across their stress threshold and then they're into frank distress and they start to have additional symptoms. One of the reasons that more severe symptoms show up is because there are a lot of, of stress symptoms that don't show up even when stress is elevated as long as your stress level is lower. Okay, let me again use the car analogy. Your car engine could start to have some issues because you didn't change the oil, but it's not really changing the, it's not making the engine fail and the car's not running any differently <clears throat> and you're really getting along fine even though you have this foundational issue that's emerging because the, the engine's running out of oil. So there's a threshold that you cross at some point where there's just no oil in the car or whatever it happens to be, too little oil in the car. And once you cross that threshold, then you start to get the severe issues. Maybe your engine stops working or something happens, okay? So it's not a smooth linear relationship. If you're like 5% low on oil, I'm not a mechanic, but I'm guessing your car is going to run fine, right? Um, if you're 10%, you know, 15%, as you start to approach a greater quantity of being low on oil, you're getting closer to that threshold, but your car might continue to function okay. Okay, until you cross that threshold. Let's say that you're 75% low on oil. Maybe that's the threshold where the engine actually starts to run differently or you have some problem. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So if you think about your body and your mind and your, your being, we are like that too, that we often maintain functioning even if the foundational stuff is starting to go awry. And it's not until we cross certain thresholds that we start to experience distress, either in diminished functioning or in you know, feeling, feeling frankly, subjectively miserable. So obviously, I say all of this because my attitude is that you do need to pay attention to the foundational things that you want to have in play in your life that contribute to optimal well-being 
and optimal resilience. And yet what the path is, as I said, is usually people are ignoring these things, either mostly or largely, until they get distressed and then the check engine light comes on and then they say, I got to do something about it. I got to take a stress management course or I have to go talk to a therapist or whatever it happens to be. And that's the, the next step on the journey when the person says, maybe something needs to change here, right? Now, what I find is that the attitude that people have at that point, and you may have had this happen to you because ha- this is the way we do it. What we do is we say, okay, I was fine and now I'm distressed and I'm distressed about this thing. And what I really want is for the thing to go away. Or I want some sort of simple, straightforward thing to make the distress go away, right? The problem with that is if you just chase the symptoms of stress and you don't address the fundamental resilience, meaning the foundational stuff and your ability to cope, then that's akin to the check engine light coming on and you just put a piece of tape over it so you don't have to see it, right? Or you smash it with a hammer so that pesky light goes off, okay? That's how Western medicine and Western psychology often treats symptoms. If you get a headache, just take a Tylenol and ignore it. Well, maybe there was a reason you had the headache in the first place, right? So maybe you could prevent future headaches. Maybe you could have prevented that headache if you had actually taken care of your stress, okay? But we don't approach it that way. So what people tend to do is they show up at therapy and they say, John, uh, you know, I'm distressed about such and such. Just help me not feel that stress. And again, that's not crazy, but it's insufficient because again, that's like going to the mechanic and being solely focused on having them turn the check engine light off. Okay. That's usually not your only problem if the check engine light's on, right? So if the light's on, not because of a faulty sensor, but because you really have some issue and some reason for the light to be on, what you need is for the mechanic to help fix the fundamental problem, right? Not just turn the light off for you. But this is what people pursue is, is basically symptom relief. People say, you know, I'm feeling distressed or I'm having headaches or I'm anxious or can't sleep. And so I want you to fix that symptom, right? So this is again, what leads us on, on this path of resilience, because as a therapist, what we therapists do is often try to explore the history, the context of the current issue that the person is presenting with. So if the person presents and says, I'm anxious and I can't sleep, of course we can give some tips on how to, you know, calm down and how to try to have good sleep hygiene, but we're not really doing our clients good service if we only focus on symptom management and if we only focus on getting rid of the pesky, the pesky check engine light. What we really need to do and what I try to do and what I'm sharing with you is a holistic attitude of addressing the foundational stuff that we need to think about and explore and develop in our lives so that we start to be more generally resilient in the face of challenges, which on the practical level means that we cope better with particular challenges, but in general means that we're actually more of the time operating below those thresholds, meaning the thresholds that tip over into frank distress, okay? So the ideal goal in life is not really to be stress-free, but the goal in life is to have balance across all the domains of our life so that we have mechanisms of resilience that are generally functioning to keep the car running, okay? We want to generally be having things in play in our life that basically act to counterbalance the loading up of stress that happens when particular challenges emerge and we face them. And examples of that would be generally trying to get good sleep, generally trying to get a moderate, regular amount of exercise, keeping caffeine and alcohol low, okay? There are some very common tips that we can share. If you watch the videos on my channel, you'll see that I do share these types of tips. Um, so there are some of these, these low-hanging fruit. If you want to have a relatively minimal engagement with your overall plan and project of 
becoming more stress resilient, there's some low hanging fruit that are pretty easy to identify and to experiment with, like less alcohol, less caffeine, better sleep, regular exercise, trying to get good social support, doing something that has to do with others, like volunteering or donating or being social and things like that. There's some predictable things across different domains of life that can actually act as those buffers for stress to generally keep you down below your threshold, right? And, and yet, I think that people are better informed if you really want to work with your life to generally improve your resilience if you do take a comprehensive look at just what am I up to? What am I experiencing? What types of things am I responding to? What are the challenges in my life? Do I have any deficits? Like, yeah, yes, I exercise regularly, but I have no friends. So my social life is kind of thin. Uh, you know, so the paradigm that I use and that a lot of people use to holistically, to broadly consider the different domains of life in terms of how we're experiencing our life and how we're functioning in those domains is the PIES acronym, P-I-E-S-S. I made a whole video about that, so if you want to watch that, I'll put it up here at the top, and I'll also put the link to that video in the description if you just want to click on it after you end this video. But the PIES acronym stands for physical, intellectual, emotional, social, and spiritual. And as you can see, that those are uh, broad domains, maybe comprehensive domains that cover you know, basically everything in our life. And the PIES acronym is a way for us to have a framework for taking a look at our life, right? So I could think physical, okay, am I getting enough exercise? Am I getting enough sleep? Am I eating a good diet? Am I not putting too much caffeine and alcohol into my body? Things like that. Intellectual, which is mental, you know, what's my state of mind? Am I clear? Am I fogged out? Am I ruminating or worrying about something? Am I fixated on a particular issue that I'm, that's coming up in the future that I can't stop thinking about? You know, so we think about our mental life. We think about our emotional self. We try to build emotional resilience and emotional intelligence, and we identify what challenging emotions we're feeling. We think about our social self, what are the quality of our social connections and opportunities. And we think about our spiritual self, which even if you're not spiritual or religious, we all want to live meaningful lives. So we think about what am I up to that has meaning because we have to have meaning in order to be resilient. It just works that way. So anyway, the PIES acronym is a framework for examining yourself so that you look across domains in your life and you examine how you're experiencing your life, what exists in your life, what's distressful in your life or what you might want to change. And that can then lead you on down the path to explore specific strategies to improve your resilience within each domain, right? So for example, let's take the first one, physical. If I examine myself physically and part of what I decide is, you know, my sleep isn't that great. So I need to do something with my sleep hygiene or if I decide, you know, I've had this plan to exercise ever since my New Year's resolution didn't come through, but maybe I need to figure out how to have some regular moderate exercise, right? So the specific strategies flow from the awareness that you have, that you have when you shed the light of your awareness on the domain of your life, okay? So if I'm going to get better in that domain, it's because I pay attention in, in the right way. And then I explore options, okay? Now, again, how do you find those options? If you're taking a look at yourself, talking to a therapist is a great way to do it. Obviously, I'm biased because I'm a therapist. But um, there are bajillion stress management books on the market. There's one that I used in my um, course, uh, Open and Hessen Stress Management for Life. Um, I'll put a link for that down in the description. Um, and by the way, if I put links in the description for products, it's usually an affiliate link, which doesn't cost you any more. But when people use my affiliate links to buy stuff, it ends up supporting me in the channel. Um, and also, by the way, if you like this kind of content, please hit the like button below. If you have yet to subscribe, please subscribe. 
and I love comments. So if you have comments for me about this video on this uh, particular video, or if you watch other videos, please feel very free to comment because I like that type of feedback and the ability to interact with my audience. Um, but anyway, there are lots of stress management books out there. There's another one that I like by Rick Hansen called Just One Thing. I'll put a link for that in the description as well. But, um, but you could get a stress management book and do that kind of thing. You could do journaling, you know, you could go talk to your pastoral counselor if you're a member of a congregation. You could, you know, you know, just brainstorm things that you know have worked for you in the past that maybe you've neglected and that you know reliably will help you lower your stress, but you're not doing it lately, right? That's one way to explore it as well. Plus, here on YouTube and on the internet, you know, there's a bajillion resources for how to lower stress. And again, um, there's a playlist on my channel here about stress management techniques. I've got several videos there that you can watch that also give you additional ideas for how you can continue on your path to try to be more resilient, right? So thanks for joining me today. I know you got a lot to do with your time, and I appreciate you taking a minute to join me here to talk about how you can be more resilient. Be sure to subscribe and stay tuned for the channel because I will keep making videos like this, and hopefully some of them will be enlivening for some of you because I would like to help all of you thrive better. Okay, thanks.